Why should we give land to the Indians when it clearly says on the paper it belongs to the farmers? But surely you must realize that this is their home. These indigenous tribes have been living on this land for hundreds of years. Listen, this war is not fair. Some people win, some people lose. The whole world think they can tell Brazil what to do with her land. Sorry, no. We do what we please. Our Earth. She is ever in flow and motion. A dynamic symphony of forces, all working together, breathing life into the four corners of the world. And for millennia, cultures the world over have called her their mother. incredibly beautiful planet, a home that we will hopefully pass on to generations to come. But as the years go by, it's becoming increasingly hard to imagine what kind of a world we're leaving behind us. We've spent the last four years traveling around the world, filming the stark reality that people now face from the threat of ecological collapse. It's now become very clear to us that there's one thing driving the destruction of our ecosystems faster than anything else. Let us show you how this very same thing might just also be our salvation. environmental scientists warn that we are fast approaching the point of no return if we don't make a substantial course reversal. We see really serious catastrophic effects in the next few years, certainly in the next decade or two. The world will be com completely different from the way it is now. Since 1900, we have seen a dramatic increase in worldwide weather-related disasters. There have now been four times more weather-related disasters in the last 50 years than in the previous 100. We began to work together to move this issue onto the global center stage. There was a lot of discussion about the contribution from uh, buildings and from industrial factories, uh, but I became aware during that same period of time that there was another factor that was going undiscussed and that is the role of animal and agriculture, which I could see was playing some significant role around the planet. But this was the elephant in the room no one wanted to talk about. Whatever environmental issue you want to look at, from you know, species loss to water pollution to water use to climate change, animal agriculture is one of the top causes. The critical widespread negative impact of animal agriculture on our planet is undeniable. Severe global crises from climate change and environmental damage to species extinction, hunger, poverty, disease, and antibiotic resistance, all of these have direct connections to animal agriculture and the massive inefficiency of our current food production systems. A report published by WikiLeaks as far back as 2009 
exposed the conversations between Nestle executives and US officials called the Tour de Horizon. The Nestle executives said that their own research had shown that the world was set to run out of fresh water within the next 30 years. It stated that one of the greatest reasons for our detour down this catastrophic path is the global demand for meat products. If you look at the, the impact that food choice has on, on global warming, it's very significant. Eating meat is huge for global climate. And that's something where personal choice is the determining factor. So there's the only case I can think of where individual human choice would have a big effect would be uh, food. We're now over the line. And the idea that we're gonna double meat production between now and 2050, this is just unsustainable. This is gonna have to give. Our diet is taking us to an abyss. A significant reason why livestock production has been having such a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions is because of the large surfaces of forests that have been destroyed in order to make room for pastures and for the uh, growth of soybean and maize uh, for feedstock production. Our forests were once full of the most incredible life. In more recent years, we began to grow an insatiable appetite for meat and dairy. And as our demand for more meat grew, we needed more and more land. So we slashed and burned our way through the pristine forests, destroying everything in our paths to make way for the animals we desired to eat. As these animals weren't allowed to roam free as they naturally do in the wild, their grazing areas soon became empty. And so of course, we needed to feed them so again, we slashed and burned our way through more and more forests, sowed the ground with genetically enhanced corn and soya, and then doused it in pesticides, herbicides, and synthetic chemical fertilizer. Animal agriculture has literally changed the face of our planet. The Greenland is used for human crops, a great area that spans the globe. And yet the land we use for animal agriculture, shown in red, now occupies vast amounts of our Earth's land, a far greater area than that used for human crops. Almost all the Earth's surface is now bears the mark of some kind of human impact. And most of that is livestock production. Agriculture has transformed the planet like nothing else. To produce milk, we farm an area about the size of Brazil. To produce beef, we farm an area about the size of Canada, the United States, the whole of Central America, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador combined. To produce eggs, we farm an area the size of Sweden. To produce aquaculture feed, an area about the size of the UK. A plant-based diet would reduce the amount of land required to produce our food by 3.1 billion hectares. That's an area the size of the entire African continent. The Amazon is the world's largest tropical rainforest. This ancient and richly biodiverse world is slowly being replaced. It is often assumed that much of the soy being planted in Brazil is for human consumption. In fact, less than 6% of the soy grown across the globe is fed to humans. The vast majority is grown to create animal feed for livestock. The soy is exported all around the world and fed to the billions of chickens, farmed fish, pigs and cows that we eat each day. The forests are not only home to millions of species of wildlife and plants, but are also great regulators of our planet's atmosphere. Day by day, they slowly breathe in the carbon dioxide, whilst producing billions of tons of fresh oxygen for our air. Each year, an estimated 18 million acres of forest are lost, which is roughly the size of the country of Panama. It is thought that about half of the Earth's mature tropical forests have now been destroyed. And some scientists have predicted that unless significant measures are taken, 
on a worldwide basis, by 2030, only 10% of the forests will remain. One of the most precious things we have in the world is our rainforests. The rainforests are literally being uh, chewed away um, by farmers who know they can make money by cutting another acre and then another acre and then another acre for need. Nossa avó, naquele tempo, cacique, então eu já falo, olha, você vai sofrer muito, porque o branco, o ruralismo. Each year, hundreds of tribes people, indigenous to the Amazon rainforest, have their villages burned to the ground. They have been forcibly removed from their land, with many of them murdered by the agribusiness paramilitary who seek to turn their jungle home into farmland for growing soy for livestock feed. One of the worst affected tribes is the Guarani Kiowa in Mato Grosso do Sul. Para nós indígena, antigamente as florestas que é a nossa casa. Quem começou a destruir a nossa aldeia é através da agropecuária. Então derrubaram as nossas matas, destruindo os animais, os rios. Eu tô falando, é, agora vai plantar soja, aí depois vai passar veneno, né? tudo coisa. Vai passar adubro também, vai cair tudo no rio. E é, nós é, revoltando nosso tecorraco para sustentar a nossa família. Né? So there was actually a report that came out in 2018 and they found that the world's top five livestock corporations now release more annual greenhouse gas emissions than ExxonMobil, Shell and BP. It is crazy when you think about it because the EU is spending 24 billion pounds of taxpayers' money on livestock farming each year. And this is at a time when we are facing an ecological collapse and we drastically need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's no surprise that people are asking a lot of questions now about the fact that there seem to be some serious conflicts of interest going on here. There's some very heavy lobbying going on of government, and I think that happens throughout the world. And it's just a historic thing that needs to be, I think, rebalanced. As I've mentioned to you over the phone, um, I've worked with a number of large livestock companies around the world. Um, so the way it works is that a representative from or, uh, pays us usually up to half a million euros. We then target the relevant uh, politicians from different governments around the world and motions are made to pass legislation in favour of the company's business strategies. For environmental policy, we can be very persuasive in order to abolish or, or, or heavily relax environmental regulations in government so our clients have more freedom in their work. Uh, I mean, the other day we managed to kill proposed legislation that would have had a, a huge impact on the industry based on a report from the UNFAO. You know, the industry is, is just concerned with growth, but the environmental data that's coming out now, it's, it's really making that difficult for them. Today, democracy does not always function as well as it should because of the huge influence 
that uh, agribusiness corporations and livestock producers in particular exercise on decision making. A former director of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, Dr. Samuel Jussi, warned as far back as 2010 that interventions by agribusiness lobbyists were blocking reforms that would offer better standards for human health and preserving the environment. Big animal agribusiness corporations and food producers' influence over political decisions about the regulation of their industry has long been a concern for campaigners who see the narrow interests of the industry taking widespread control. If we have any doubt about how powerful this influence is, we can recall that, for example, when the Advisory Committee on Dietary Guidelines in the US made recommendations to the US government as to how dietary guidelines should be shaped, they were blocked by this very powerful lobby of agribusiness interests. In 2013, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization released a landmark report called Tackling Climate Change Through Livestock. The report states that livestock farming is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than all global transportation combined. A growing number of scientists believe that the impact of animal agriculture is, in fact, even worse than stated in the FAO report. There are close ties between the research organisations and governments and government policy and industry. It's very pervasive because livestock industries depend on government policies that support them. The FAO report um, was prepared within the FAO by specialists of agriculture and livestock production, not by specialists of the environmental issues associated with uh, agricultural production. I believe that a more serious concern, of course, is that the International Meat Association was involved in preparing the report, which does raise the question of the independence with which the study was prepared. Government policy in that regard is not for the benefit of the land, it's for the benefit of the industry. In their report, the FAO partnered up with member countries, non-governmental organisations and many other organisations, including the European Feed Manufacturers Federation, the International Dairy Federation, the International Meat Secretariat, the International Egg Commission, and the International Poultry Council. In an industry worth over a trillion dollars, are these not the very institutions that have the most to lose from a damaging scientific report against livestock farming? There are few people that know more about the ocean than Dr. Sylvia Earle. Dr. Earle was the first woman to become chief scientist of the United States National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and held the record for spending more time walking along the seafloor at depth, untethered than any living person. When I was a child, the idea of a dead zone in the ocean was, was not even in our vocabulary. But in the 20th century, as agriculture began to greatly expand, the areas around the coast began to show signs of wear and tear. The first most notorious spotlight area, I think, was off the Gulf of Mexico. And it has simply grown over the years, an annual phenomenon. It is coincident with the application of massive amounts of fertilizer. The millions of square miles given over to growing feed for the animals we eat are heavily sprayed with nitrogen fertilizers. The nitrogen runs off the fields, working its way down rivers and eventually into our oceans. The nitrogen rich water stimulates massive overgrowth of algae, resulting in algal blooms so large they can be seen from space. The algae starves the water of oxygen, leading to the death of the marine life around it. Since the demand for meat has grown, these low oxygen dead zones have been steadily growing and growing. hundreds of dead zones that have developed all around the coastlines of the world. And, okay, people say, that's, that's too bad for the fish. So sorry, fish. But 
We need to understand that what we do to the ocean, we're doing to ourselves. I want others to see and, and to see for themselves. This is all we've got, this little blue miracle. It is believed by some that switching from eating meat to fish will have a beneficial effect on our planet. This simply could not be further from the truth. If the ocean dies, then we humans would probably die with it, as every other breath of air we take has been created by our ocean. As reported in the leading science journal, Nature, we have lost nearly 90% of all large fish in the ocean since the 50s. One of the most in-depth studies ever carried out investigating fish stocks, also in the journal Nature, stated that at the current rate of fishing, the world's fisheries are predicted to collapse in less than 30 years. According to IPBES, the intergovernmental body which assesses the state of our biodiversity, the leading cause of marine life extinction is fishing. Our taste for fish is literally draining our oceans of life. Today we have agreed on fishing opportunities for European fishermen worth more than 5 billion euros and benefiting more than 50,000 fishermen. The catches agreed today will continue to make the European fishing industry highly profitable also in 2019. Norway, a beautiful country with breathtaking landscapes. It is also a place that harbors some darker secrets. Norway is one of the world's largest exporters of farmed fish, an industry that is worth billions of euros to the country's economy. As much of the wild ocean large fish populations collapse to near extinction, fishermen are turning to aquaculture as a way of growing fish in a controlled environment. Norway produces more farmed salmon and cod than any other country in the world. About 70% of the fish we eat today now comes from artificial fish farms. As thousands of fish are kept close together in very small sea cages, disease and lice spread easily and have become a massive problem for the industry. As a result, pesticides, disinfectants and antibiotics are used extensively to keep the fish alive long enough to go to market. In order to rid the fish of lice, special pumping boats are used, which suck the fish up in a giant water vacuum. The fish are then pumped through the system 
and as they flow through, they are either heated to a high temperature or bathed in a chemical solution which removes most of the lice before being pumped back into the cage. The fish are bathed in chemicals such as hydrogen peroxide and azimethophos to kill the parasites and diseases, and given feed with chemicals such as teflobenzeron, emamectin, and diflubenzeron, which, by their very nature, are toxic. Researchers have found that traces of chemicals can end up in the fish, and ultimately on our plates. This is much the same for farmed fish all around the world. Taryn Bishop, an environmental activist, is meeting with the Green Warriors, a conservation organization based in Bergen on the west coast of Norway. The Green Warriors have been investigating the devastating practices of fish farming on the local ecosystem for many years and are taking Taryn to see the darker side of the farms that lies beneath the surface. A specially built submersible has enabled them to see the seabed below the cages. All along the ocean floor lies a thick layer of sludge made up of fish waste, bacteria and uneaten feed. The sludge is full of the pesticides added to the feed and new research has shown that the massive amounts of pesticide being added around the world to the marine ecosystem in fish farms is having a devastating effect on the natural ocean biodiversity. The sludge also releases large amounts of climate warming methane. Researchers at Oxford University have found that some types of aquaculture are now releasing more methane than beef production. Liv Holmfjord is the head of the Norwegian Directorate of Fisheries. Whilst in Norway, we were given information that not only is she in charge of regulating the country's fish farm industry, but also owns shares in one of Norway's largest fish farm companies. Many conservation groups feel this is a great conflict of interests. Holmfjord has agreed to meet Taryn to answer questions about the state of Norway's fish farms. Well, fish farming is quite a new industry in Norway. It started back in the 1960s with some local uh, entrepreneurs starting with hobby, and it's grown until it's a billion uh, euro industry today. And um, seafood is the second largest export industry in Norway, and fish farming accounts for two-thirds of the export value of seafood. So recently, we found out that you also have shares in one of the largest fish farm companies in Norway. Do you not feel that that's a conflict of interest? Uh, of course, there could be a con uh, in conflict of interest, uh, but this is a fact that's been known since before I got this position, and I've been open about it. I do not. I'm not involved in the business from uh, day to day or at any. So it's and if there's um, uh, we have. And um, I have. Sorry, I have to. Do you have to start over again? Can I hit that for So all the decisions that I made will either be for the whole industry, not specially for this fish farm, or it's only an advice to the politicians, and the politicians are setting the limits and the actual regulations. So if there's an uh, actual case uh, handling regarding this company, then I will step aside. A few jobs and I was working here over the years as a diver. We used to be around the fish farms cleaning the, the dead deceased fish from the nets and uh, fixing the nets, etc., after storms. And on occasion, we'd seen some of the boats coming in to clean the uh, lice off them. It's quite a lot of dead fish, you know, diseased or they've died, but it's a lot of pink mush, 
you know, no, 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 uh, no healthy look. Having seen what I've seen and worked on the various sites around about where I've been in Scotland, I, I wouldn't eat farmed salmon. Uh, no, I would have. <laughs> uh, pretty, pretty rank. Salmon is marketed as healthy. It's also marketed in, in, in a very devious way, deceptive way, that they think it's a wild product. So it's a fake product, it's a fatty product, it's contaminated, it's marketed as healthy, but, it, but it's not. So salmon, if you see salmon, alarm bells should start ringing. It's pretty grim when you dive down to the bottom of the cages because, you know, we always see the bottom full of dead fish. And it's basically because many of these fish are so diseased, so parasite-ridden and laden with chemicals that they become sick and they live out their sad, short lives basically looking like zombies. You know, you don't see this when you go to the restaurant or the supermarket, but this is basically what a lot of the fish actually look like before it ends up on our plates. So tonight, Don wanted to show us how much of the farmed fish actually dies. Because of the very unnatural and unsanitary ways that they are kept, and they have rows of very large metal containers that they are constantly filling up with the dead fish. And I have to say that the smell as we get closer is actually pretty disgusting. So this is the sordid side of salmon farming in Scotland. This is the, the dirty secrets the industry don't want you to see. This is disease-ridden farm salmon. It's 15 to 20% fat. That's where the contaminants, the cancer-causing contaminants, PCBs, dioxins, and the artificial colorings are. So this is something to be avoided at all costs. This is the salmon farm, just here. We got freedom of information data from the Scottish Environment Protection Agency showing the use of over 50 tonnes of formaldehyde, not just at this site but other sites across Scotland, is formaldehyde may cause cancer, suspected of causing genetic defects, toxic if swallowed, may cause respiratory irritation, causes damage to organs, do not breathe. One of the fish farm workers told us that the workers um, come down to the farm um, early in the morning, spraying the chemicals into the fish cages. So they're obviously spraying something down there in the water. The guy who gave us the tip off said that toxic chemicals are widely used across Scotland, including formaldehyde and also hydrogen peroxide. And these are supposed to treat the diseases and life problems which are both rampant across the fish farms. You know, these are not chemicals that you want in your body. Whatever he's spraying must be pretty powerful if he needs to wear full protective chemical suit and a face mask. As the ocean becomes a dumping ground of seven billion people and farms saturate their fish with chemical feed, eating fish has never been so toxic. You know, our oceans have become humanity's sewers. Everything eventually flows into the sea. So if you had a, you know, time machine that go back before the Industrial Revolution, it's a different story. But now, the highest levels of many of these persistent organic pollutants, we're talking about, you know, DDT and PCBs and uh, dioxins, the highest levels in our food supply are found in the aquatic food chain. 
fish are not the safest choice anymore. So, Tony, it's great to see you. Great to see you as well. Thanks Thank for coming. Not at all. Thank you. A pleasure being here. So, I wanted to ask you if you could share with us what, is, what exactly it was you began to feel when you realized something was going wrong. I was exhausted more than usual. And then I was losing short-term memory, and that scared the hell out of me. And then I tore my rotator cuffs in a really intense snowboarding accident. And the doctor said, do you want to do your metals test? And I said, ah, I got my amalgams out 25 years ago. He goes, there's so many metals in the environment, you should do it. So I did. I get a phone call a week later, and I said to my assistant, just have him send the report. And he said, no, it's an emergency. He has to speak to you. And he's like, no one wants to hear that. And so I called him up, and he said, Tony, I showed your blood tests. You have extreme mercury poisoning. On a zero to five scale, which is what we measure, five being toxic, you're 123. The doctor said, how long has this man been in the hospital? And I just got off stage. So I, I, I said, I can't understand this. So I, I went out and they thought, you know, maybe someone was trying to poison me because the number was so high. And I was very disciplined. I was a vegan for 12 years. And then I just went salad fish, salad fish. And they brought the medical group out here and they looked at it. And I found this man named Dr. Shade, who's the only guy who has an ideation process where you can see where the mercury came from. And it was fish. Mm -hmm. It's been three years, um, and I had some severe moments. It burned a hole in my esophagus, and I literally collapsed. I lost a third of my blood supply. I could have died. I lost half my hemoglobin. People begin to lose their hair, yes. their memory. They lose their memories, they, as you were doing, as you, yes. no, as you yes. noticed. But they can also have headaches. They can complain of fatigue. Um, they can also have depression. What we're seeing now is with the toxic environmental exposure, and especially with the mercury, methyl mercury in fish, is that everyone has got to be careful because yes. the levels are going up. Udo, tell me, because your specialty is in this, how do you get the fish oils that we all need for the brain and for the body uh, if we can't have fish? What, yeah. what do you suggest? Well, we used to get them from fish oils. Yes. And But we can actually get them from vegetables. Flax is the richest source of omega-3 that we everybody thinks should come from fish oil. If you get enough of that as starting material, your body will make what the fish oils make and it'll be clean. Many people take fish oils or have fish for the long chain omega-3 fatty acids. And you have to ask yourself the question, well, where do the fish get them from? And it turns out they get them from the algae in the ocean. They get them from plant food. So if you want the purest form of the long chain ready-made omega-3 fatty acids, the best way of doing that is simply to take an algae supplement because then you've got the purest form of it and you don't have the extra risks of having the toxins and the heavy metals and the saturated fat and the cholesterol that you would get from eating a fish. A peer-reviewed study from researchers at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego undertook one of the largest studies of fish pollutants in the world. The scientists found toxic contaminants in fish right across the planet's oceans. Nobody would go to the nearest body of water and put in like a cup and drink the water. Um, you're, you're basically getting the concentrated toxins if we're eating fish. Our oceans have also become filled with plastic. As the oceans are so large, it is a challenge for any scientist to accurately understand where most of this plastic is coming from. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch, covering an area of about 1.6 million square kilometers, may provide a unique opportunity to better understand the growing problem of microplastics in the sea. A team of scientists from the organization Ocean Cleanup have been studying the patch for some time and were surprised when they discovered that the vast majority of plastic in the patch is not from old drinking straws or used plastic water bottles, but from thousands of tons of discarded fishing gear broken down by the sea into trillions of pieces of microplastic. A study recently published in the journal Nature found that about 80% of the plastic in the Pacific is made up of discarded fishing gear. Many scientists agree that one of the greatest things we as individuals can do to solve this problem of a plastic ocean is to move away from eating fish and switch to a plant-based diet. At least half of the plastic in the sea today comes from discarded or lost fishing gear. Because all those nets, all those lines, all that stuff, it's, it's just become a plasticized ocean. But we have a chance. We have a chance right now to change our eating habits. There's an estimate that there's over 5 trillion tons of plastic currently floating in the ocean. It's absolutely everywhere. Everywhere we look, we found microplastics, whether it's at the polar regions, in remote islands. 
Also, if we're looking on the surface or the seabed, and everywhere in between, we find microplastics. We've also found microplastics in just about every animal group that we've looked in. We've been sampling for microplastics for quite a while now, and we found that there's 27 times more bits of plastic than there are fish larvae. Microplankton are found throughout the oceans. They are filter feeders. When the researchers add microplastics into the plankton's environment, they consistently observe them ingesting the plastic particles. Unaware that the tiny particles are made up of toxic chemicals, the plankton consume them indiscriminately. The researchers observe how the chemicals accumulate within the organs of these small marine creatures. The toxic plankton are then eaten by larger fish, and researchers have found that much of the fish that we are eating today has bioaccumulated these chemicals within their flesh. A study by the University of Plymouth found that over a third of all the fish tested contained microplastics. As we eat these contaminated fish, we ingest the same toxic chemicals into our bodies, and recent research suggests similar toxic accumulation in humans. Our scientists tell us we're now in the sixth extinction event of life on this Earth. It doesn't even make the headlines. No one even knows about it. ตอนนี้น่ะวะคุเกเบนเพราะอัตเตนคืนนี้ไซติตาดีไซติเซเมตานี้ซานยานุโรเดกยานุนี้ติซาปอตโรยานุเพราะอัตติมุคอไอโร
Some scientists have begun to call this current crisis a biological annihilation. According to the journal Science of the Total Environment from Florida International University, livestock farming is the leading cause of biodiversity loss. According to a study published in the journal Science, if the entire world were to switch to an exclusively plant-based diet, we would free up over 75% of the world's arable land, and many of the forests previously cut down for livestock farming could be restored. There are now many great initiatives around the world doing just that. Ecosia, an online search engine similar to Google, is one such initiative that uses the revenue made from advertising to pay local communities to replant trees. One of Ecosia's main foresters is Mauricio, who has been working hard to replant the rainforest in Brazil. I planted my first tree when I was 5 years old. I never imagined that 20 years later, é, esse esforço tão pequeno teria virado uma das iniciativas que mais plantou árvores na história do Brasil. Foram mais de 2 milhões e meio de árvores, 2 mil hectares plantados, muitas áreas preservadas pela ação de combate a incêndios florestais. breathe life into our world. When we plant a tree, we sow the very seeds of our future on this planet. The most recent in-depth study into the environmental impact of what we eat was a peer-reviewed journal by an international team of researchers. This landmark study headed by Dr. Marco Springman of Oxford University in England, found that in order to have any chance of keeping temperatures below the dangerous two degrees Celsius threshold set out in the Paris Climate Agreement, in high-income countries, we need to drastically reduce our consumption of meat by around 80%. Policymakers have been very, very reluctant to address the livestock issue. It's entirely out of keeping with the urgency of the crisis that we're facing. Hi, Otto Brockway for Brockstar Films. Um, this is a question for Commissioner Hogan. The scientists at Oxford University have been very clear that livestock farming has a far greater impact than plant-based farming. With this in mind, would it not be common sense to reduce the billions in subsidy payments to livestock farming in Europe and offer them to plant-based farming instead as an incentive to a much more sustainable food system? We have made our proposals based on protecting the farmers uh, because they are, unlike you and I, they're out in all sorts of weathers and in all sorts of market risks. And you and I may not know anything about that because this is their lives. This is their producing high quality food for us all so that we can have this particular good quality products available to us at all times. Sometimes under local conditions like organic, more times it's conventional farming. So we provide financial support at the moment for that. And it's a public good that's not always recognized. But the movement of our policy is in the direction of our farmers being centrally involved in providing more public goods. And if you want to do anything in life, you have to pay people. Sometimes I understand that there's a moral obligation and there's people of principle. But most of the time, 99% of the time, they have to get paid. So as professionals that we're expecting to provide good quality food and do more on public goods, we pay our farmers. This is the decision that we make at political level. Livestock emit methane and nitrous oxide. Now, most people, when they think of climate change, they think of CO2, carbon dioxide, which is a very potent global warming gas. But methane is 25 times more potent per molecule when it's released than CO2. And nitrous oxide is 298 times more potent per molecule than CO2. These are very powerful global warming gases. So today we have a very special camera um, called a hyperspectral imaging camera. And it basically enables us to be able to see gases that would be otherwise invisible to the naked eye. And today we're looking at methane gas. Methane is a gas that is being produced by cows when they belch. Methane, together with the other gases it produces in the atmosphere, has caused a third of global warming since 1750. 
Livestock are the largest source of methane that we can control. Steep cuts in methane emissions can slow global warming by 15 to 25 years, making it the most effective means we have to slow warming in the critical years ahead. Whoa, look at that. To demonstrate the different heating potentials of climate gases, we can look to an experiment known as the infrared absorption experiment. Here, we see four Earth-shaped ice statues, each one in its own airtight chamber. The chambers represent the atmosphere surrounding the planet. Each has an infrared heater placed above it, set at identical temperatures, and each one is then filled with a different gas. The first chamber is filled with normal air that we breathe from day to day. The second chamber is filled with carbon dioxide, a well-known climate warming gas. The third chamber is filled with methane, a gas associated with animal agriculture. And the fourth chamber is filled with nitrous oxide, also a gas associated with animal agriculture. Over time, we begin to see the ice statue in the carbon dioxide chamber slightly melting compared with the normal air. But in the same short time, the statues in the methane and nitrous oxide chambers begin to melt rapidly as the temperature inside rises considerably higher than both the normal air and also the carbon dioxide. 16 hours later, the results are stark. We can clearly see that the methane and nitrous oxide, the two main gas byproducts of animal agriculture, are potent climate warming gases. Of the estimated 70 billion land animals reared for human consumption each year around the world, nearly 90% are chickens. An emerging problem is that chicken consumption is now on the rise. Whilst chicken has a lower environmental impact than red meat, over 90% of chicken globally is now intensively farmed, and this is having devastating effects on our planet. If we compare the equivalent protein calories for meat and plant-based proteins, such as chickpeas, chicken does less harm to the environment than commonly consumed red meats, and yet still causes 40 times more climate-related warming per calorie of protein than chickpeas, and uses 50 times the amount of water. We know that if we would shift from um, ruminant meats to other meats, then we probably would reduce um, our footprint just from, from that particular product by about a factor of 10, which is quite a bit. Uh, but if you compare that with how much you would reduce uh, your footprint if you went to plant-based products, that is a, about a factor of 100. Uh, and that's the reason why shifting to more, towards more plant-based diets has such a big impact, because we're really talking about different scales here. Organic meat has been claimed to have less environmental and climate impact. However, a study carried out by researchers at Oxford University found that, in fact, Organic or conventionally produced meat has little significant difference in greenhouse emissions. So in our data, we didn't find big differences between organic and conventional across multiple indicators. What we did find is that no matter how you produce animal products, even the lowest impact forms of production still create higher emissions and use more land than typical vegetable proteins. So that's saying something really important. That's saying that even if you go into the shops and try and purchase sustainable meat or dairy, it's always gonna be better to purchase vegetable proteins instead. Each year, the US government gives around $20 million to subsidize fruit and vegetable farming. But meat and dairy farming get a massive $38 billion from the government. It is now estimated that the annual cost to the US taxpayer of diseases related to meat and dairy consumption are now around $314 billion. When you, you know, cram you know, tens of thousands of animals 
in these cramped, filthy, unhygienic conditions basically live atop their feces. It's just like a breeding ground. Animal to human diseases that arise um, because of the way we're now treating animals, whether it's these live animal markets in East Asia, um, whether it's the bushmeat trade. And the concern is that with enough spins at genetic roulette, on these swine factory farms, these chicken factory farms, we're going to you know, end up with one of these viruses that's not only deadly to chickens, but can jump and, and transmit human to human and cause the next human pandemic. The risk of large-scale factory farmings increases the risk that we, or the likelihood that we might have a pandemic, particularly of influenza in the future. This pandemic has been very severe, but this is not necessarily the big one. Swine flu, which killed over half a million people, is believed to have originated in pig farming. AIDS and the Ebola virus are believed to have come from eating wild animals, while MERS from camels, and also camels' milk and meat. SARS is thought to have spread from live animal wet markets, as was the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Bird flu is believed to have come from chicken farms and also live animal wet markets. And the measles virus is thought to have originated from farm cows. People know now what a global pandemic feels like. Um, they've seen the effects. They will be feeling the effects for many years to come. And that this is a chance, I think, an opportunity to point out that this particular route of infection is, is a, a, a very concerning one. The World Health Organization has announced that the post-antibiotic era is near. A time where a simple scrape on the arm could become fatal. Our miracle life-saving antibiotics are being rendered useless due to overuse. Not because of overuse by humans, but because we give them each day to billions of farm animals. for six years, one thing I know is that if people knew what happened in the production of their food, they wouldn't eat meat. So one of the things that we would hit every day was pus nodules, tumours, cysts. It was something that we would hit on a daily basis. Having worked in a supermarket chain, I was, I saw this firsthand every single day. So here's one that's running along the shoulder blade. Oh. Yeah. That is what I remember in the butchery. It comes out like a thick toothpaste. I remember that every single day. That's interesting to hear you had that experience yeah. all the way over there, because in the UK, exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, we would see that on a daily basis. But th those people who say it's uh, it's not my butcher does this, yeah. they need to open their eyes, because yeah. if their butcher's being honest with them, we know, yeah. we both know, we and, were in, and, we and were any honest butcher's gonna admit yeah. it. They're not gonna wanna tell the public because it's gonna affect their business, yeah. but it is a fact. And me yeah. working in multiple butcheries, I saw these common trends across the board. So I know that it wasn't just isolated to the one that I was working in, it was across the board for me. People need to reconnect with what they're eating and the whole process that we were, we were yeah. talking about here of how that food gets to them, um, it's hidden from them and it's hidden for a reason because if they saw it, it would most definitely make them want to think harder about what they're eating. As our oceans and atmosphere begin to warm, the water cycles of the planet are beginning to change. Climate change changes the water cycles of the planet. The heat that's being generated is forcing the precipitation into the clouds, so we're getting more concentrated precipitation in our clouds and more dramatic, extreme, and unpredictable water events all over the world. In the northern region of the remote Pacific island of Taiwan, the Atayal people live high in the mountains. Taiwan is no stranger to extreme weather, but in recent years, the strength and frequency of the typhoons have increased. This has had a devastating effect on the Atayal people and their way of life.
Whilst much of the world has been experiencing increasing levels of extreme flooding, in many places, the opposite is happening. Much of the world is increasingly entering into extreme drought, destroying thousands of tons of crop, as millions of farmers struggle to find enough water for their fields. I'm definitely worried about the future of our farm. I think um, we're seeing you know, much more, uh, many more swings in climate than we've seen in the past, but we want to use uh, all the land that we have to grow food, um, but we haven't been able to just because of the, uh, the shortages of water. It'll have an impact on food supply and prices and uh, availability. And so estimates now are between 500,000 to over a million acres of farmland that'll come out of production in California. Almeria in the south of Spain is home to 31,000 hectares of indoor vegetable farms. Almeria produces half of Europe's fresh fruit and vegetables, an essential component in the supply of the continent's food system. Worryingly, Spain has been in the grip of a 20-year drought, a drought that climate experts suggest is closely linked to climate change. In terms of water, the truth is that the drought in Spain has become a complete catastrophe. Our harvests are decreasing in massive quantities. Last year, in the area we are now, there was almost no harvest. People don't realize the food system is collapsing. As a result of this shift in the global climate system, the drought across Africa has deepened. Rivers and lakes that supply hundreds of millions with fresh drinking water are beginning to run dry. As new conflicts break out over these dwindling resources, we are witnessing the beginning of a mass exodus of people moving north, desperate to survive. These climate refugees are willing to risk everything to get themselves and their families to what they see as the safe shores of Europe. In response to this modern day mass migration, Spain has built a massive wall that runs along its southernmost border in Melilla. Thousands of refugees are beginning to swarm the border fences overwhelming the Spanish police. Amid predictions that this migratory pattern is set to increase, it seems increasingly clear that our world is poorly prepared to cope. Osbal Andrel Osquigerbit As the Gobi Desert in Mongolia begins to spread deeper and deeper into the country like a beast consuming all life in its path, many of the lakes that support both the people and the wildlife have now dried up. If the lakes continue to disappear, then the people will be forced away from their home and into distant and strange lands. Oh, 
Sayın People talk about how much fresh water we use for hydro fracking. 700 billion gallons globally is wasted on fracking. So 700 billion gallons. Sounds like a lot. But animal agriculture, the production of animals that we use for meat around the globe uses 70 trillion gallons of fresh water a year. Hundreds of thousands of times as much as fracking. And, and, and we give the, the cows and the chickens the good stuff, right? They don't get the Flint, Michigan, lead tainted condoms floating in it water. They get the top shelf stuff because we don't want to screw up our sausage links. And I know what some of you are thinking right now. You're thinking, oh, here's the part. I'm a vegetarian and pigs are people too, man. But no, let's ignore how the animals are treated in our factory torture farming. Let's pretend they're treated amazing for just a minute. It's like a celebrity backstage at the Oscars. They're just being fawned over and they get swag bags with free Apple watches. Point is, you should still be upset about this because Animal agriculture is killing us. And corporate media is fantastically pathetic on this topic. They never mention meat production. They never mention that a quarter pounder takes 660 gallons of fresh water to create. That's the, that's the equivalent of showering for two months. So one usually underestimated impact of uh, livestock production is the huge amounts of fresh water required uh, for that production to be maintained and to be increased. The problem is that in many places, uh, water is being used much faster than the natural renewal rates. Overall, in the world, uh, 1.8 billion people are living in areas with severe water scarcity. The livestock sector is the single biggest water user in the world. One third of the water use in the world is being used for producing animal products, meat and dairy. And it's not because those animals drink so much, it's really because there's a lot of water required to make the feed for the animals. If we want enough fresh water for future generations, water alone dictates that we must change our diet away from meat and dairy. All over the world, we can see evidence of a global shift towards animal-free foods that is enough to give us some hope. In 2021, a record 580,000 people signed up to the UK's Veganuary campaign, and it's estimated that there are now over 4 million people identifying as vegan across the United Kingdom. In Canada, it's estimated that 10% of the population are now either vegan or vegetarian. And in the US, over 50% of chefs have added vegan items to their menus, with a 600% increase in the vegan lifestyle in the last three years. A few years ago, it was quite a challenge to get hold of good vegan food, but today we're pretty much sport for choice, and there are vegan options everywhere. Which 
hard to say which one is. <laughs> and they taste exactly the same, honestly. These are not the chicken. No. That's interesting. Which one of this is animal meat, and which one of this is plant based? Meat or not meat? You're not sure. You're not sure. Yeah, you're not, yeah I'm not sure. Meat. You? Yes. Are uh, wrong. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. But you think the second one was chicken? Yeah. The second one was actually plant based. No way. Yeah, and the first one no was way. chicken. Yeah? Um, okay, I didn't. No, I, I couldn't have guessed that. I definitely thought the first one. Yeah, definitely. It seems that changing what we eat to a more sustainable diet can also coincidentally be very beneficial to our health. There is a growing understanding that we can actually prevent and in many cases even reverse some of our most common diseases all through a shift towards a whole food vegan diet. Humans can survive on many different kinds of diet. But many decades of research has now shown us that the best way of not just surviving but truly thriving is on a whole food plant-based diet. A human can be healthy on a plant-based diet without any animal products. The major dietetic associations around the world, including the British Dietetic Association, have produced statements to say exactly that, that a diet made up of whole plant foods is healthy for humans for all stages of their lives. And not only can they be healthy, but they can restore or reclaim their health adopting a plant-based diet. There are certain areas, certain populations around the world that have extraordinary health and longevity. For example, the largest number of centenarians, people that live over 100, these so-called blue zones. What's really interesting about the blue zones, they actually have more centenarians than anywhere else in the world. And a centenarian is someone that lives at least 100 years. Uh, but, but what's really interesting about the Blue Zones is when people reach these advanced ages, they are still productive. So the Blue Zones have taught us a lot. And the bottom line is we really want to try to emulate what the people of the Blue Zones are doing. The five regions known as the Blue Zones are Okinawa in Japan, Sardinia in Italy, Ikaria in Greece, Nicoya in Costa Rica, and Loma Linda in California. So the question is, well, what do they all have in common? They have a predominantly plant-based diet. They have a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, soy, lentils, chickpeas. They have a diet rich in all these nutrients, and that's one thing that they have in common. So the EPIC study is the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. It followed over half a million individuals from 10 European countries for more than 15 years. Those in the EPIC study that were eating predominantly plant-based or eating high levels of fruits and vegetables lived longer, had lower incidence of cancer and heart disease. About 2,500 of the individuals in the EPIC Oxford only ate plant food, so they were vegan. Um, and even though they weren't the most healthy vegans or healthy plant eaters, you could show that these plant eaters were healthier um, they had a lower incidence of heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. From everything we have discovered on this journey, it seems that moving away from animal foods to plant-based foods instead can not only give us a whole host of amazing health benefits, but also gives us a chance to be able to leave a sustainable planet for future generations to come. Perhaps the single most meaningful change that we can make as individuals is ultimately deciding what ends up each day on our plates. We are running out of time. The world community must acknowledge that animal agriculture is the most destructive industry on our planet. We can't wait for government policies and other organizations to create a better life for ourselves, we need to stand up now and make our voices heard. Globally, for the typical consumer, avoiding meat and dairy is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on Earth. Without addressing uh, what we eat, we simply won't make it. This is a number one priority. This is a next step in taking responsibility for our communities, our planet, our biosphere, our fellow species. 
People say, what can I do as an individual? It feels overwhelming. Well, you can make individual choices. We all can. Our individual choices affect the collective choices. When you hear about airplanes and cars, and we're still going to use those things. But the choices we make in our diet, this agricultural business where we use animals as the primary source of protein, the one thing I think we can all do is, and individuals, is make our own individual choices, how we're going to live, how we're going to eat. Plant-based diet makes all the difference in the world. Just make some choices that are good for you, and being good for you will be good for the planet. This planet is our home. And it is up to us what happens now. History has shown that when we stand together, united in a common cause, we can achieve great things. Before us lies an opportunity to build a world in which we can thrive. But the clock is ticking. And time is running out.